Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Triple Option, but no, 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 no. Not just me, not just my two compadres, my two amigos. No, we got some friends, we got some backup. Because this is a combination, this is a crossover event of the winter. The best thing to ever happen in 2020, which is a very low bar to clear, and I think we will, because it's Triple Option meets the Seminole Rap Podcast, basically in a massive round table edition, going over the season that was a retrospective of the 2020 Florida State Seminoles. As always, join by my boys, Coach AB, Adam Brown. Say what's up, buddy. What's up, buddy? Perfect. Very obedient, as always. Kevin Little, say something else besides what's up, buddy. How's it going? Kevin <laughs> <Good laughs> Olds, baby. Great. And the newbies, the, the newbishes. We've got uh, my guy, Juan Montalvo from the Seminole Rap. Juan, hey, welcome to video. Uh, video is not a good format for me. I've got a face for radio. Ah, you look good. Just stay away from the camera. Tim Allenbaugh, <laughs> also from the Seminole Rap. Tim, how you doing? Nice whiteboard. Trey, I'm, I'm happy to be at the triple option combination Seminole Rap. I'm happy uh, to have you here. And the, the editor of Tomahawk Nation, who looks like he just stuck his finger in his mouth and put it in a light socket, <laughs> Perry Costadakis. How's it going? Good. I mean, I'm looking at Tim in jealousy because he has a nice haircut. And yes, then I'm he looking does. at Adam in appreciation because he has a no haircut. So it's a nice like yin yang balance going on for me tonight. The, it's good. You look like is, one of the wet bandits after they went into Kevin Foster's <laughs> house. <laughs> Can I just What's say funny, that the last time I was on with you guys, I was just in a full suit. So again, it's, just appreciating the two extremes. That's why I'm that's here. Right. Tim. Can I just say that if I if I look like Adam with my head shaved, it would be shaved in a heartbeat. I mean, Adam's yeah, head is that, like that round head, it's man. Perfect, man. It, if I did mine, I'd look like a Klingon or something it's, like that. Just like ridges or something everywhere. It's, cone head. Look like Abdullah the Butcher. And Adam, you do have a very symmetrical head, uh, and we'll get we'll talk about head symmetry probably later. Because let's get to the main course. Listen, there's no there's no um. There's no film on this edition. This is going to be more of a high level kind of a retrospective. It's also going to be released on audio format. So like I say, every single time, subscribe to X's and Knowles YouTube or else I'll find out where you live. However, also subscribe to the Seminole Rap, a Tom Hawk Nation presented podcast, the RSS feed, because you get that hot fire every time. We're going to go through the topics. All things Florida State. Let's just start it off. Going to kick it to my boys, and we'll we'll get the discussion flowing. So, just kind of going over the season that was. Florida State finished with a record of three and six, going by the S. Yeah, <laughs> not great. S and P plus rankings, which is Bill Connolly's kind of advanced stats. There's other ones out there. Measures quality of play. We'll just use it because those are the numbers that I looked up before the podcast. Florida State was the 91st best team in college football this season, which is putrid with the 71st ranked offense, the 90th ranked defense and the 77th best special teams. Now, what do those numbers mean? Let's compare them to last year and Willie Taggart's last year kind of didn't get to finish the year as the head coach of the Florida state Seminoles. They had a six and seven record by that wonderful, was that a Sun Bowl and El Paso? Bowl? It's some weird bowl out in the Southwest. Uh, six and seven record. They were ranked the 58th best team in the country last year. So that's a 33 spot drop for the Knolls this year. They had the 49th ranked offense under Kendall Bryle. So down 22 spots in offense. Um, the 61st ranked D. So about a 30 spot drop on D. However, we were 109th in special teams. So as Mike Norvell said, we got better in special teams by the tune of about 30 spots. Now listen, we're going to get to the why. We're going to get to we're going to get to all the factors behind it. But I'll start with Adam. So just to think back, no hindsight. Think of what we thought in the off season. Did you think that there was any chance that the 2020 Florida State Seminoles would actually be worse than the 2019 Seminoles with how everybody came back in a new coaching staff? All right. Can we specify which offseason? Was it a pre-COVID offseason? Uh, some... Yeah, okay. Let's – if you're if you're pre, well, what was your preseason? What what did you think their record was going to be? I was thinking seven or eight wins, probably somewhere. Okay, so I think I, I think my I think I was at seven 
with the uh, wind shares. So back in August. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So think about the team that you saw back in August and why the one that we saw was so wildly different. Now, as the season went on, our preconceived notions were certainly not confirmed, and we'll get to that. But what, what, what happened this year? Why, why such a difference? Well, well, first off, you weren't able to get development because you were. So no, bot, no, nobody was able to get developed physically because you didn't have an off season with with your strike team. Um, that, that that's the first first thing that went wrong for for them. It, it's just so I mean, it's such a convoluted mess. It's so it's so black or it's so gray area. But everybody wants to make it black and white that it's hard to hard to really like pick point pinpoint sure. one thing. So I think you've got to start with no no time in the system in the off season. There's there's step one. Then you got to go to probably installed poorly via Zoom. There's step two. Then there's no time with your strength and conditioning staff. There's step three. So, and then once you got in the season, you've got guys, and we've talked about it in nauseum. You've got guys that are fourth head coach and four year, you know, fourth head coach uh, or third head coach in four years fourth offensive coordinator, fourth defensive coordinator, whatever. Uh, the, the continuity just w- made this team an absolute mess up top. Um, and unfortunately, all your best players were older guys who fell into that um, fell into that mess. So you had all the things that happened in the offseason. You had guys that just really, frankly, didn't want to be a part of what was going on and what Mike Norvell wanted to do. And then throw in inconsistent quarterback play, throw in being forced to run an offense that you didn't really want to run, throw in a defense that just was atrocious and was missing maybe the most important piece all year long at Hamza Nazardeen. Uh, it just, I mean, it was just a, a crap show from the beginning and really there was never a chance. But, you know, you're when you're looking at your wind shares and I was sitting down doing all the wind shares, you, you know, you've got your rose color, your garnet gold glasses on, and you're saying, okay, a little bit of coaching is going to get these guys yeah. over them. I mean, I, I thought they were coached better. I did think that. I mean, I, I thought guys – we'll, we'll get into the ways, yeah, like yeah. The, the effects that Norville had. But, Kevin, it looks like you wanted to say something. Yeah, and I, I kind of wanted to touch on the defense. I, I think around the country you see – uh, you saw that defenses were weaker this year, um, just based off the eye test, the the score test, and I think a big reason of it is if you think of defense as a as like a wall, right? You're trying to stop something. If there's a piece of that wall that's missing, then that wall is not stopping anything. So on defense, everything has to be working together, and you need that extra install time and that extra uh, practice time to be able to make sure that everything is working together because it doesn't matter if one part is the best part in the country if another part is non-existent then then you guys are gonna be in for a rude awakening and I think particularly first year first year defensive coordinators this year struggled around the country Ole Miss's defense was was garbage our defense was garbage Mississippi State's defense was half decent for some reason um but uh, it's just harder uh we had to break in a lot of players a lot of a lot of guys we thought were going to step up um, on the defensive side of the ball, as seniors just just really didn't uh, for whatever reason. And I think I, I think we were really hurt by the shortened install time compared to teams who have already had the ability and the time to put in their systems. Right, and I think in the the Zoom the Zoom sessions, the shortened install time, that was all actually information that we were accessible to when we made our predictions of like six wins, seven wins. I just think collectively, I don't think we – and I'm talking about it as like a Florida State beat media, not just like Tom Hawk Nation. I don't think it was given enough credence for how important that it actually was because it really was. Now, Juan, Kevin was kind of talking about missing pieces – um, what were some what were some position groups that you were really hopeful for in the preseason that just didn't meet the expectations? Like what really stood out in their mediocrity? Well, we're we're recording on Sunday. I think the twenty eighth here, twenty seventh. I'm not twenty seventh. I could see you chewing on a you were chewing on a, a coat hanger before, which is funny because it is in an audio format. So maybe some of the plastic. Uh, chipped off but we are here on the 27th of december <laughs> okay well i've been this is also going on video one. and drinking paint for a long time so um yeah no so the anyway here on the 27th we saw that joshua kane doe was declaring for the nfl draft um and we really didn't get the best of joshua kane doe or 
or Janarius Robinson this year. I mean, we, did, we saw maybe a little bit of, of flashing from from Janarius later in the year. Uh, someone pointed out today in, in, in one of our Slack chats that, that uh, Josh Kando had zero sacks against Power 5 opponents this year, which was Wolf. kind of surprising. Um, I mean, an absolute lack of pass rush. I mean, we – I think we we thought coming back they weren't going to be a good group, but they were going to be decent enough that you could rely occasionally on four man pressure to get you a little bit of help, which you weren't able to you know in the last couple of years. So, um, I mean, I think that was one of the biggest disappointments as far as defense goes. I mean, the absolute lack of a boundary corner. You had Jerry and Jones come in. You thought he was going to be able to play that position for you. You know, we talked a lot in the in the off season about what Adam Fuller's defense does. And, you know, how they rely on basically the boundary side, the fox, the boundary corner, how those guys are critical to how they play. And you didn't get good performance out of either of those positions. And no, and I was – thought it was going to be solid, you know, a bit solid to good, and it wasn't there. The interior of that defensive line particularly, you had Corey Jordan who – had great PFF pass rushing numbers last year. I think that might have been somebody who looked at those numbers, was just kind of freelancing at times. Marvin Wilson's snaps were down in a decreased role. So that that interior pressure that we thought we were going to get, I, it just never materialized. Uh, Tim, any other position groups that you thought, you know, maybe penciled in as a strength or maybe some up-and-comers that just never really developed outside of the defensive line? Yeah, so go to offense and look at the wide receivers. I mean, it's yes. been a question mark for how many years. Um, and, and But, you know, Tamori Ontario is coming back. You you know, that announcement came out last January. Everybody's hyped up. And and I, I don't know if I've seen somebody that has that ability just underperform the way that he did this year. I, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. You know, he, the Georgia Tech game, he had a loss of a family member, so you're kind of like, ah. Oh, Right. Stand that we make an excuse, but it, I think we had one game that he hit over 100 yards, maybe. Um, and then from there, it was just like, what? Then he had the nagging injury, and then there was talk about the locker room chemistry, but not even him. But you, you had Keyshawn Hilton come back and score a touchdown in the first game, and then did he catch a pass for the rest of the year? Yeah. You know, it was milk did... carton time. It was no, <laughs> no, it did not have a bounce back year at all. Um, it, it, at the beginning of the year, if I told you that, uh, that, that Wilson was going to be Ontario Wilson was going to be your most reliable receiver. You would have like said, well, we're going to, we're going to win what a game this year. I mean, you never would have like called him out as your, as your most reliable, but in the end, that's what it was. Uh, young Jordan young was the abusement park vanished. Shut down. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. COVID got COVID shut yeah. down. You know? <laughs> no good. No uh, no. Kendron Portier we thought was going to really, come on and he just didn't really get as much time and the the team just lacked a total receiving threat I mean it allowed teams to really just when they wanted to shut down Florida State's run game because you couldn't depend on the receivers at all yeah last game against Duke I think that statement when you saw the guys that were actually lined out wide like the Ja'Kai Douglas's and Lawrence Tofili's those guys are running backs so it was <laughs> to me I think that was the most disappointing position Perry my beacon of positivity. Talk about it. Let's talk about a position group that maybe surprised you with how much bet, like something. Were there any groups on this team that were better than you thought they were going to be, or at least okay? Uh, I was sitting here like, oh man, everyone's going to say the bad things. I have to think of a specific bad thing because all the good ones are going to get taken. Oh, out. no, no, no. You get to be oh, happy. That's the hard part. All right. Honestly, the offensive line. Like, I think it has been talked about pretty extensively by us, by everybody else. Even the fan base has recognized the offensive line is tolerable, good, even at some points. Like, when you have that first rotation in, we saw the kind of decline that happens, especially against Georgia Tech, especially. I guess my like that's like first four game period mm-hmm. where you could barely get the starters on the field for a series was that it was terrifying. So yes. just seeing the work that Alex Atkins did there, even just having him involved in some of these recruiting battles that FSU will never win. But even that they're getting mentioned is I think just the offensive line for the first time in four years, it was the bright spot of just the overall team improvement, I think. That's a good – now, Adam, Adam, or anybody else who wants to, to hop in on this one, uh, 
was there something schematically that Alex Atkins did different? Was it just better teaching? Why was he able to take these same pieces and get better results? Or was it a running quarterback? Yeah, but I think that's what it boiled out to. Oh, fuck. I took your answer. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I mean, look, I'm not going to say they didn't get better, but I think some of the better was just <laughs> you had more capable bodies that were taking snaps. Um, you mean, you weren't were trying to run Juan Williams out there and pretend oh, that he was a yeah. college Flexible, football player. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, Mo Smith, Scott is, a, Scott is a freshman, DLT. I mean, those are guys that uh, you've, you've got to – You've got a nucleus to build around in the coming seasons, baby on Johnson. I mean, you know, he, he was an okay player. He wasn't he wasn't an average performer, but he was okay get, getting snaps. So, I mean, I think that Atkins did a great job of getting – I think he did a better job of teaching the information than what Clements pro- maybe did. Even mm-hmm. though, I mean, Randy Clements is probably the best offensive line coach in college football. Um, so, you know, I mean – it's silly to suggest that he was that Atkins is doing some amazing thing that he couldn't do because that's that's just not the case. But I think Atkins probably had a little bit more to work with. I think maybe he related a little bit more and, and frankly maybe cared a little bit more uh, with what was going on, um, knowing that he was going to be here for or hopefully be here for a little while. Um, but yeah, I mean schematically, and I mean they weren't doing anything earth shattering. Okay. It's, it's a lot of zone, you know, some some different gap schemes, but. Uh, you know, I think the, the use of an in line or the use of tight ends helped a little bit, but really it was Jordan Travis. I mean, it was what they did with him. Juan, did you see anything? Yeah, I actually sort of want to expand on what, what, what Adam was saying is it's not just the fact that there was a quarterback that made your offensive line look better. Um, it was the positive of not having a quarterback who made your offensive line look worse. Ah, um, I mean, yes, you know, yes. all, all due respect <laughs> to James Blackman, who's been a great servant, you know, as a, a you know great program ambassador. We'll put it's it that way for Florida State. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he really was a punching bag for Florida State. But, I mean, the kid was not a very good quarterback, and he made that offensive line look worse. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of average college football quarterbacks who would make that offensive line look, you know, to their skill set. He Blackman made them look worse. Travis made them look better. So, I mean, that definitely, I think, contributes to that as well. Like, they took a more measurable jump because they went from being looking worse than they really were to looking better than they probably actually are. Yeah. Kev? K-Man? K- K-Dog? Yeah. K- I, I kind of am uh... – Moving the conversation on at my own pace, but I think that uh, Jordan oh, Travis's contribution can't be understated. Uh, ah, well then, state away, state. I I think he I think he played about as well as you can expect. <laughs> right? Like I, I don't yes, know what I I do. I props on J, JT Hive. I uh, want him to be integrated as an offensive weapon next year he, when he Mister Milana comes in. He's one of the he's one of the best players in the ACC when he's got the ball on his hands. Yeah, uh, be it a, as a quarterback or a running back or or whatever, he's dangerous, and and other coaches know it. There's we can pretty much get quotes from every every coach that played against us about how how scary Jordan Travis is, um, and I, I think he's a great piece to have in, in our back pocket. Um, you know, is is he going to go win a Heisman? I don't think so, but uh, <laughs> he uh, he will not. No. <laughs> I think his I think his throwing ability is slightly underrated. I think people discount him because he's such a good runner. Um, he was he was throwing to to some some below average wide receiver groups yes, right jabronis. now. And uh, throwing to <laughs> I, I don't know. A few of those picks were were not on him that he threw, and a few of them were. He, he's not going to set the world on fire, but I, I think he did a great job moving the offense forward. And when he was healthy. Our offense looked like like a solid off, offense, you know. Uh, the main reason behind a top five upset of North Carolina at home, and I do I do agree with you. Not only the running quarterback and all the other issues, the elimination of a quarterback that held the ball too long and made a bad offensive line worse. The entire just sea change in philosophy that you could see happen in that Jacksonville State game. Uh, when they brought Jordan Travis in, when they leaned on the, the option-heavy pieces of Mike Marvell's playbook, yeah, it made the offensive line look a lot better. So, yeah, all valid points. And I do love watching Adam bristle when people are overly praiseworthy of Jordan Travis. It's very I fun. love Jordan Travis. He, he 
It's the only reason they won three games this year. <laughs> yeah, we Two. probably don't win any, honestly. No, no absolutely I don't not. think they did. That's what I was no. going to say. He's a, he's a three-win quarterback. You know, he adds he adds three wins to your team without him. <laughs> That's a pretty without good war. Um, so, we talked about preseason expectations. Tim, I want to zero in on you. When was the, the oh, poop moment? When you realized when you were looking at this team, when did it hit you like, oh, they're bad again? <laughs> Well, I didn't have as high of expectations when we got the ACC release schedule because I thought that was a, a brutal a brutal schedule, which they didn't play fully. So I, I think after that, I, I this was before Jacksonville State was on there. I think we had talked about, you know, they'll be lucky to get five wins. Yeah. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, I, I love recruiting. Adam and I, we talk about it all the time. Um, Jeff Sims, Georgia Tech quarterback, former Florida State commit, was committed to Florida State forever, and and then you kind of saw as he got to his high school senior season, his accuracy really fell off his senior year. And so when Florida State dropped him and got Purdy, it wasn't as big of a loss. You're like, okay, that's that's not that bad because Sims really struggled when the pads came on. And then you you find out that for Georgia Tech, Jeff Sims is going to start, and you're like, well, this Cake. is about you. Give this me the money. You. And money. Jeff Sims – picked apart the secondary just up and down the field like relentlessly in the most unimpressive way like yes. possible just like ah oh, the crossing route again oh no we're befuddled uh, oh a five and out okay another five and out okay you know all the way down the field <laughs> it was it was at that moment where you're just like ah, oh, here we go again and and then couple that with with the offense can't do anything again with James Blackman and he's getting sacked by Georgia Tech's underrated defensive line or not underrated, just not good defensive line. Yeah, they were, and, they were hurt too during that game. Yeah, yeah, they didn't have Clayton. And, and you saw that happen and unfolding in your eyes and they have that lead and it's being evaporated. It's like, here we go again. Where's Willie Taggart? Is he like, you're going to like – go to the sideline and like pull off a hood and, and there's oh, Taggart. It's me, him. Austin. It's me the whole time. <laughs> that, that was it for me. Perry, what's your oops, I crap my pants moment when you realize that, oh, <clears throat> this is going to be a long season. I can't say Georgia Tech because we're not going to say Georgia Tech. Tech. No, you can't. You cannot. I'm not disallowing it that answer. Was. It was. So now I have to lie. So you're making me yes. lie to the people. Okay. Yeah. Because, gosh, if you could have seen me and Tim trying to record the summer wrap that day, we literally had to just, like, for 10 minutes be like, what do we talk about for the rest of the season? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay. So, okay, I'll, I'll help you through this one. I'll share. I, I had an answer, but I'm excited for your rebuttal. Okay. So, I, I think Georgia Tech was a little bit of Virginia Tech syndrome. You lost a close game you thought you should win, but there was always that glimmer of hope. Well, maybe Georgia Tech's on – maybe they're just a secret – they're the secret sleeper of the conference, right? Because nobody knew how good anybody was at that point. We've realized that they suck, and we sucked worse. Now, Perry. That, oh, my gosh. Because my UCF blew them out the next week. So that was like, the <laughs> ultimate, like, oh, gosh, if UCF is blowing them out, then they're absolutely not terrible. Honestly, the Miami game, because that yeah. was like when I was like, oh, they don't even care. There's no fight whatsoever. And I, like, moderately proved wrong, as I saw over the season. Like, I think there was good effort. I think that was maybe an oversold part of the season, that players were kind of loafing. Like, they were trying hard. They just tried hard and messed up. So, I but think... that any game, like, just no hope whatsoever of any single positive thing happening throughout that entire 60 minutes was just, like, like Jordan Travis getting – like he did the Walking Dead, he that was his ultimate. Like he turned that day. That was the day. He turned. <laughs> yeah, the zombie guy. Yeah. Like, uh, that was just it hurt on so many levels, and that was when we had to convince ourselves into Tate Rotomaker. And then you had the first half of Jacksonville State, <laughs> and that's when you're like, they are literally not going to win a game this year. That one hurts Kevin Little. That's, 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 that's the topic. Kevin was really unhappy about that one. Nah, I love it. Uh, the one is Mike Leach. It, like, it makes a better comeback story. The Mississippi State. You know, we're not. We're not gonna. We're not gonna. I will not tolerate any slander of the pirate on this. We're not talking. Um, we're not talking negative pirate. 
Well, the so Stone Cold, by the way, is a anti Mike Leach podcast, and the Triple Option is a pro Mike Leach oh, video whoa. series. Whoa! So we have bro. a clash of series here. No, oh, good. It's just like yeah, we're, we're the people that actually are looking at the film. So <laughs> burn. Hey, no <laughs> argument for me. You got to go ahead. Good, good, so. Ah, you've been burned, sir. All, All right. right. If you really want to make this a true NWO, WWF, 90s feud. Oh, Jesus Christ. No attitude error. Hold up. We can go. Listen, I can go, I can go reference for reference for days. We'll save that at the end. But that was, that was wonderful, one. You're man after my own heart. Now, let's, Perry talked about hurt. <laughs> I think there were some times that I, I, I'm struggling to think of any specific um, examples right now of when effort was questionable. One thing that I don't think is questionable is that the buy-in that we thought that the team had was at such a lower level than what we really expected. Like that there was, so the effort you can question the buy-in, which was like a, was trying to be painted as a positive in the off season. That team was not bought in fully across the board. Now, Juan, I'm going to go to you because you said NWO, so that's fun. So you get the next question. I'm going to let you choose. Choose your own adventure. What was either your high moment or your low point of the year? And everybody can choose their own. So if you want to be optimistic, be optimistic. If you want to be negative, negative Nelly, go ahead. But what's a moment that stuck out to you in 2020 that may be remembered down the road? I would say, I mean, the – the UNC win was actually, I mean, that was fun. I mean, you know, there's, it, it, there wasn't a particularly uh, high moment of that game that I could think of that was like, okay, you know, this, this is a good team for the future. This is a good team that's actually going to turn around or anything like that. But there's nothing more fun than like a big upset against a big, you know, a, t- a top sure. 10, top five ranked team. I mean, uh, going back to the 2000. Eight BYU game, I think it was two thousand eight, two thousand nine. I don't remember exactly which one. Um, but like when you when you're when you're a crap team and you beat a team that's highly ranked, even if they're not you know like a top three type team, it's fun. I mean, you know, it's it's that simple. K man, memorable moment for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, my first game was at the UNC game, the first game in the press box that I've ever got to do. So that that was definitely a high moment. High moment for me. Uh, low moment would probably be, uh, yeah, Jacksonville State when we were losing. At First one. half, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and Tate didn't make me look very good right there. Uh, yeah, that was probably the low moment. That was a moment when you're like, man, I did not realize uh, we we could lose to literally anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pull your mic closer to your face a little bit. You're a little low there. Um, Tim, what about you? There you yeah, go. Get up, go in back. It. Get up in it. I know we're all talking about the UNC game, but I want to talk about a specific part of the North Carolina game. Uh, it was right before the end of the first half. North Carolina finally scored, and Florida State followed it up with an absolute bucket-type catch to Warren Thompson, which Warren Thompson deep the receivers or the defenders by never, like, moving, which I'm not still sure that that was intentional, or if he just never saw the ball either, and it just ended up in his hands. That was then, fun. Make it a statue. It's <laughs> a legend immortalized in bronze. And then followed it up with that beautiful pass to Cam McDonald in the back of the end zone. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, we're going to win this game. Um, and, and then probably the, the low point may have been the second half of the North Carolina game up until – uh, that guy just unbelievably dropped the pass at the very end. But for me, it was the Louisville game, being that I live in Louisville, and watching uh, Javian Hawkins get basically tackled in the backfield 10 yards, and the Keen Dent is standing there, and Hawkins just goes right past him for like 80 yards. <laughs> it was just like, <sighs> the, whoa. The, the defense's performance against Louisville to me is the – just dump truck moment of despair for me of the entire season. I thought that, that, that was pretty rough. Uh, anybody else have any other moments they want to share before I kick it to Adam for something else? Perry, go ahead. You got your hand oh, sheepishly oh, raised. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was a little bit nervous. Just can okay. I ask my question, please? Um, please go ahead. I thought the Notre Dame game honestly was one of the higher points. Cause you saw interesting. Yeah. What Norvell and his staff could do as far as like scheming and planning for a team that was clearly better. Like you saw it come into fruition against UNC, but the fact that they were in it until the end, Against Notre Dame, it wasn't just like, oh, here's the fourth, first quarter, like, 
good effort, guys. Like, consistently competed throughout the end. Probably weren't going to ever win that game, but the fact that they had hope, I think, is reflective of what can happen in the future when they start to, like, put the talent together and the scheme together and the personnel together to actually take on these big teams and those over-the-hump type wins. Right. Happen, then you have kind of hope for when that hopefully – Gets there. That's a good. Okay, that's good. Yeah, the second half of the Notre Dame game. I agree. I agree, hundred percent. Now, I was going to ask something about coaching, but I'm going to flip it up just because I feel like this is going to flow with the conversation better, and I'm a rebel. Um, Adam, who are some guy? We the roster is being purged. It's being trimmed like a fatty brisket as we speak. But who are some guys to build upon? To for 2021 and beyond that showed out a little bit in 2020. Well, I mean, I think you start with Maurice Smith and Robert Scott up front. Um, yeah, those are two goggles. And, and I would say DLT, but I, I want to kind of focus on guys that are going to be here a couple of years. So, Mo Smith and, and Robert Scott are two guys up front that I think you've got. Uh, you know, you're going to look at as going to be staples of your offensive line. Um, oh boy, I, I like Jay Sean Corbin. I know he gets he gets knocked a lot. To, you know, is he? You know, should LaDamia Webb and getting all his carries and all that stuff. Uh, Corbin, Corbin and, and Toa Philly in the back, you know, in the backfield. I uh, like Douglas in the slot a lot. I think he uh, brings a lot of versatility that, that, that you've got to like in, in, in a Norvell offense. He can play running back. He can play slot receiver. Uh, and he's a guy that uh, showed some explosiveness down the field, uh, which, which they are severely lacking. Uh, defensively, though, it's like, man, gosh, who tough? Where, where uh, I think Fabian Lovett inside is a is a good piece. Dennis Briggs inside is a good piece. Good. Yeah, I think those two played well. I think the safety duo of Jay and Green is going to be a nice duo back there. Um, I'm really worried about the linebacking core, which you, you know if you've been watching the triple option um, <laughs> as well, you should. Yeah, I mean. There, there's not a ton of talent on this on this roster still, and everybody's going to be, uh, you know, excited about what's what's going on, and you know, it's going to be a new year, and we're going to want to throw our garden and gold glasses on, but like, there's still a la- severe lack of talent on this roster, and they've got a, you know, they've got a lot, they've got a lot of work to do in the transfer portal, and it seems like things are starting okay. I mean, I don't know if I can talk about the no, 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 we'll okay. get there, we'll get right, there. Right, right. The patience to cross up. Thank all you. Right, right. I don't want to jump the gun. I don't want to pull Kev. Well, I was gonna I, talk yet. I was gonna throw it out to the like as a free for all. Anybody else that you guys think we should build on? Adam went through the roster name by name. <laughs> Juan, do you have He's somebody here. else that wasn't mentioned that maybe we can build on? He skipped one of the best ones, but then one of the uh, easiest ones, Cam McDonald. I mean, uh, Cam McDonald. He's he's a guy that I mean, that's you know, what are your what are your threats downfield? That you know, he's one of the few downfield threats you have right now. I mean, you named uh, Adam. You named like three running backs. Um, well, I didn't. I didn't want to include guys that are only going to be here for one more year, and I, I like kind that. Of, I did. kind of thought McDonald's gonna is one of those guys that he's got one one year left. Okay, fair enough. Um, but I'm going to include him in mine because I'm not going to use that same uh, same caveat. So I think Cam McDonald's guy that is somebody you're going to build on for at least next year. I mean, and he's going to be an important part of what you do for the next year. So, Perry, are you raising your hand? Oh yeah, sorry. I'm. I just. I'm, well, Kevin started speaking, so you have to go after Kevin. So Kevin, you go, and then Perry. Kevin, you are assertive. You win. Yeah, I think uh, AB definitely brought this kid up, but uh, I I love what Toa Philly brings you uh, at the running back slash slot slot position. Um, I I know you talked about it, but you kind of mentioned everybody in the roster, so uh, (laughs) I think he deserves uh, a little bit of credit. Uh, He just looks so explosive. He's really good. I I really like him in in the zone, uh, outside zone heavy scheme that uh, Norvell usually runs. He's going to find that hole, make one cut and get downfield. And you saw it a couple times. And I, th- I think he was one of the best, most dynamic players with the ball in his hand uh, that we had on the field at any point in time. And I'm looking forward to him getting a heavier workload as, as his career progresses. I agree. Can't wait for him to get some weight. <laughs> I, want to go, bones. I want to go back to Jay Sean Corbin a little bit. And Adam sort of mentioned this. Um, Jay Sean You'll Corbin's get there, guy. Perry. We're going to get 
<laughs> Sorry, Perry, but you got to be assertive. Um, Jay Sean Corbin's guy who there's a reason they trusted him on all the Wildcat runs. I mean, he is he's a guy who they can trust to make the zone reads. I mean, you know, and what I mean by that is the, the reads that the running back has to make on those outside zone, those inside zone type runs. And I think that's part of why we didn't see as much of Joe Feely there yet. I mean, Kevin alluded to it. He's a guy who's going to be that guy in the future, but Corbin already is that guy. I mean, he's a guy who you can trust for the next couple of years. Got better as the year went on, too. I think he started to get healthier. Yeah. Uh, Perry, go <laughs> ahead. The answer better be good. Oh, I mean, it might be a hot take, but I think Travis J is good at football. It's not a hot He's take. Good at, he had a good interception. Yeah. yeah that, I the think potential is there. So, yeah, as a guy to build he off of. Can build yeah. on, and, I mean, this is kind of cheating, but Demory Tate, and then you also get Jared Wilson back next year. Like, the players at FSU lost before the year, I think – it's a fair point. Yeah. Make a big difference this year. I mean, if you have that big body in Wilson on tight end, like that helps so much more to AB's point earlier about how much the tight end helped the offensive line out this year. If you have your highest rated recruit from this year on defense, maybe the defense isn't. I can't even think of the proper adjective. It isn't. It's watchable. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's. What I was trying to figure out what would what wouldn't be a lie, which actually not abysmal. Yeah, it was pretty bad. It's pretty depressing. Uh yeah, I agree. So that, that that's that's very it's fair to point out. You have a Jordan Wilson. You don't have to have like a preferred walk on of a Preston Daniel in there. Whoa, like, no Preston Daniel there. slander. I, 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 was gonna, I was going to oh, put yeah. with an uh, with the asterisk. I enjoyed his trick play. He's a he's a guy he built like yeah, that myself, wasn't a trick. So he was just going him. straight up field, man. It's just it's smash mouth. All right, get into the coaching staff. I'll get with the more fire. I'll get with the more technical the technical filmy people here in a second. But Tim, we're both laymen. We're man of the people. You got a better haircut than me. I concede that. What was the biggest like effect that you saw the biggest positive effect from the coaching change, just from maybe like an outside observer perspective, if there was anything that you noticed from Willie Taggart to Mike Norvell. So I think the, the narrative you heard was you went from Jimbo Fisher, who was very strict, very, everybody had to follow the rules until the end uh, or unless you were a superstar to, to Willie Taggart, who was everybody's buddy. And and then you went back to Norvell, and, and right off the bat, you had all these people talking about how strict and how hard he was, and these players weren't going to respond. And the, and the thing that stuck to me was, and yes, the upperclassmen for the most part did not respond, but the the new guys, the new blood, the younger ones, they really seemed to buy in. And the thing that struck to me is, it feels like these coaches understand that each player needs to be addressed differently. Um, like for instance, I, I look at the last game and Robert Scott, I think gives up a sack off the, off the right side. And he comes off and Alex Atkins is the first one right there in his face, but he's not screaming. He's not yelling. He's teaching and he's telling him, you know, what's going on. Whereas at times with Dante Lucas, they had to get in his Much face. different <laughs> mindset. To, yes. And, but, yes. But, it, but it was reaching them in the right. way that they needed to be reached. It wasn't everything was this way. It wasn't everything was like a days ago. It was these coaches seemed to like legitimately in, look like they were trying to legitimately invest in these kids' lives and reach them on the level that they needed to be reached. There was. There's a lot of Edward James almost, how do I reach these kids? Uh, like mid-90s uh, teacher comes in and helps uh, poor affected students movies. They made like 12 of them. There was a lot One of them of, was a substitute and the guy was a mercenary with Tom. There was Barrett. a lot of people just turning their, a lot of coaches turning their chairs around backwards, putting the hat on. Yeah. Backwards. Yeah. How, so let me just relate to you. I'm, I'm Michelle Pfeiffer and you are my, uh, my cool, but dangerous uh, math students. Listen, <laughs> Uh, and I think to, to prove your point, I think the effect on kids like a Jarvis Brownlee, who's somebody that I'm really excited for next year, just with the quotes that he was saying, the people that like, this is what we're in. We're dogs. We're really good. Every quote that Jarvis Brownlee had near the end of the season was stuff that you really, really want to see. Kids like Sidney Williams had stuff that just, those are the quotes that you want to see. Now, as far as like tactical effects that you notice this year, I'm going to go Adam, Kevin, and then Juan in that order. What are some 
things that you notice from like a technical perspective that when Norvell would do it, be like, oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with a run game. And <laughs> that's that's nice. Around. It's a nice it's run down. game. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it starts with a run game, though. I mean, it, they, they were able to be diverse enough. I mean, look, like the last, against Duke, they ran like four freaking plays. So the the amount that was in the playbook, we have no clue. But the fact you were able to go into um, the Jacksonville State game, you were able to activate the quarterback part of the run game in that game, and, and look entirely different than do you than you really had the the entire other part of the season, or the the earlier games in the season. I thought that was incredible. Um, yep, I know. It was, yeah, yeah. It just, I just think that. You know, he talks about being an offense built for playmakers, and I know people are going to roll their eyes when they hear that because, you know, wide receivers weren't putting up massive numbers and all this other stuff. Well, I mean, I think they were really li- limited with what they had talent-wise and what they had in playbook-wise. Um, you know, so I think we were able to see glimpses of what that could become when they have just have more time to get install in and, and get guys in the system. Uh, so I just think his ability to – to scheme, I think his ability to adapt or, or what the, the technical things for me that, that, that are exciting. Kevin, anything else that you know? Of course Adam's going to talk about the run game. What about you? Do you see anything sexy? Yeah, I'm actually going to go to the other side of the ball. and um, Oh, defense. I've, I've been roasted on uh, controversial takes on this side of the ball so far this year. Oh, so. yeah, Adam Fuller uh, lover. That's uh, what I've heard. Uh, now, but, uh, <laughs> I, I really do want to point specifically at Janoris Robinson, I think that's how his name is pronounced. Janarius, Janarius, but I don't know how it's pronounced anymore. Um, I'm from so, Iowa. I I understand. So, um, <laughs> yeah, technically, you got a lot out of him in the run game. Um, yes. You're going people look at the the pass rushing stats, and yeah, that's the most important thing a defensive end can do. But uh, the development of seeing his progression, um, and we've talked about it all the time on this on this channel um uh how he plays power runs how how aggressive he is wrong arming how quickly he's able to diagnose that um little things like that between him and emmett rice two guys who you know you want to think uh old dogs can't learn new tricks you know these guys have been around forever they're on their fourth head coach you don't expect anything out of them or third head coach fourth i don't even know anymore hey we Um, don't know fourth even we have no idea um (laughs) Uh, you don't expect anything out of these kids. And yet they improved in very specific, very observable ways. Um, And I think that that kind of thing's encouraging. And you see that around the board. It's just the easiest to see out of, uh, out of those positions in my opinion. But um, yeah, I I think you just saw improvement in this year that you really can't expect much from because they have such limited teaching opportunities. Right, and the evolution of Emmett Rice, basically the confidence infusion. That was fun to watch, and it was noticeable to a big dumb idiot like myself. Why? Anything you notice from a technical standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually going to sort of echo some of what Adam was saying because, I mean, they they, they they sort of made it easy – or, well, difficult for me because they – one took offense, one took defense. <laughs> so I got to find somewhere. Talk about the long snap, right? I don't know. <laughs> Special teams was an improvement. Great long snap. It's actually special teams really was one of the greatest improvements of the year. I mean, we had what four blocked kicks or punts? I think. Thanks, Georgia Tech. This year, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> against Georgia Tech. It's still um, no, but I want to sort of follow up on what Adam's saying. I mean, you know, I mean, and it may, it may speak more to Alex Atkins and his ability to connect with kids. But I mean, they were able to do pretty large diversity of of blocking schemes. You know, quicker than you might expect, especially. Cause they were pretty vanilla in what they were doing the past two years, particularly the first year of Willie Taggart under under uh, under the thumb Greg Fry as offensive line coach, um, and Randy Clements was sort of <laughs> disappointing in the variety of what they were doing blocking wise there too. So I mean to see a lot of Adams, uh, you know, gap and down type stuff. You know, it was good to see that. So, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to throw it out to the group anyway. There's always the fan perspective is they know within an instant whether the head coach is going to bring us to the promised land or if he's a lowly garbage man that just needs to get booted out of town. Buyouts be damned. I'm going to throw it out. My grade on Mike Norvell is I'm not convinced 
that he is or isn't the guy at this point. My grade is TBD. I saw a lot of stuff that I liked. I saw some stuff I didn't like. And I saw a season that, to me, is largely useless outside of exhibition reps. Do we all agree, or does anybody have a strong take on Mike Norvell, either positive or negative at this point? I'll uh, leave it to the group. I've got, I've got a take. All right. Because we're going to get to the co- assistant coaches after this. So if you have an assistant uh, coach to take, hold yeah. it in. I've got, I've got on a the take. head man. I don't think Mike Norvell sees the fruits of his labors. Interesting. Pl- played out. He um, will not get to witness the the, the I think investment. He, the, I the, think he's I think he's Ron Zook. I think he's Ron Zook. That was uh, that was what I was just about to ask. Like you think, I think he is FSU Zook in the yeah, I, I think he back up. Yeah, I think I think he gets the roster built back up. Uh, you know, adding I, I don't want to jump ahead or anything, but adding Jermaine Johnson from the transfer portal was absolutely a, a home run steal for them. Um, but I, I, and it's a talented piece, and he's only going to be here for a year. But I, I don't think he sees the end. I think he sees his contract through, and I think they just go separate ways, and they bring in another guy who gets to inherit a, a talented roster with some good workmen, you know, work players, whatever. And I think that that's going to be when they make another leap into relevance and competing. So that would make him more of a Rick than a so, so so okay, five that's year, that's so fair. five. So you think he's going to see the end of his contract five years? But in year five, there's not going to be enough progress or enough enough on field results with a new president and a new AD at that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I, you don't I think, think he's going to get renewed, but you don't think he's going to get fired early. That, yeah, I think you're looking at like a nine. I think he's going to be like a nine nine winner. That's that's going to be the. It's gonna be the top because I don't think they're I don't I still don't believe he's gonna be a good enough recruiter to get the guys uh, to get fair. them to get them over the top. Perry, go. You did. Uh, that's, I was gonna ask the exact question you just asked. I was like, if he is gonna be successful enough in establishing FSU as like come inherit this talent and take the keys to the Mercedes, mm-hmm. then it's gonna be weird. I mean, nine wins. I think at, he has two, three more years on the contract as of right now. Mm-hmm. Nine wins by then, I think, is maybe pretty good. I think that's tolerable. I would, I would take it, but I understand what Adam. Yeah, did, but I, there's so many different ways that you get there. There's going to be a different administration. So I personally, I think if you get a nine win season, I guess depending on the quality of the recruiting they were class at that point, in 2010 and 2011. Yeah. I, but but hold on, nine wins in year four, year five are different than where Jimbo was in 20, you know, 2010. Right, right, right. Because That's, he was won. still kind of benefiting from, like, the legacy of FSU at this point. Like, they weren't a three-win team just because they were still accidentally getting five stars because they were FSU and Bobby Bowden was there. Yeah. It'll be interesting. It'll be it'll be interesting. I think the quality of the recruiting class, the trajectory, how they finish the season. I personally think a nine win in his last year probably gets him at least, like, a two-year extension. But I get what Adam said. The point still stands where – this could be somewhere where this guy did the real hands in the muck type work of this roster, which was garbage, and he might not get to see it through. Does anybody have any additional comments to the, to Adam's point? I mean, I, I personally am looking forward to when uh, head coach Alex. Oh, oh, oh. mutiny! Hi, <laughs> fun. Anybody else? Um, I, I, I think I agree exactly with AB. I was, I was thinking the exact same thing. The guy's a good on-field coach. The question is, is he going to bring in the kids you need to beat Clemson, to beat Notre Dame, to beat Miami? And I, I think I think he's going to get just short of that. And for a new AD and a new president, I want to hold on to a guy that's still losing to Clemson. Um, I, I think they're going to want to find their own guy. Questionable. That's fair. Now, oh, Juan, go ahead. I, I actually think it's too early even to make the determination that it's that he's not a good enough recruiter at this point. I mean, that's fair, Adam. You, you, ah. you. Before this season, you were saying that he was a good enough recruiter to be, you know, national championship type co- coach at Florida State, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I think with what we've seen this off season, with you know, for lack of a better way to put it, the inability to get kids on campus and then in the last month, a little bit more commitment, we're gonna, uh, so to speak. We're going to talk. We're gonna we'll talk, we'll about talk about that. that. But, like, you know, it's it, there's it's, there's too many question marks. I mean, I don't think that you can make a declaration that strong, that he can't recruit kids to the level four state needs to win a national title. 
that's and true. I, yeah, and I am asking for a little bit of uh, just trying to extrapolate a little bit with a year that is so just it, it means nothing in the larger sense, just so um, so different, so unique that it's almost it, it, you almost want to take it out when you factor in how some good of a coach somebody is. Oh, it's right. rare that I get to declare Adam so wrong though, so I just wanted to take that opportunity. I listen, <laughs> brother. Uh, here's you my twisted thing the is... knife. I was gonna save you from the rage. <laughs> Here's my thing is he can be an elite recruiter, but it doesn't matter until I, I still don't think even the best recruiters could get us to be competitive within three or four years with a Clemson. I think the gap has become so big that um, he might not get enough time, no matter his, his true ability. You just have to hope that Wuhan Dabo never stops talking because <laughs> he's had a fun PR year. The Chinese communist party play it. That disgusting, fake, little old me, southern turd, I – he's going to fall hard. I hate Dabo Swain. If you listen to the rollcast, I've hated him before. It was Good cool question. to hate Dabo Swain. Why is Dabo the worst? <laughs> so I can, don't, don't, we, we can expound. All right. We talked about – I want to talk about the assistant coaching staff a little bit. I think we all agree the biggest star of the staff is Alex Atkins, so we'll go from that. Do you feel like there's any busts on the coaching staff, or do you feel – uh, I'll go with you first, Kevin. Do you feel like any changes need to be made, either the biggest bust from a coaching staff hire of this first staff, or do you feel like any changes need to be made? Um, so I'm going to – I'll take only one of the, the obvious ones that I feel like someone else is going to take. Um, I'll touch Dugans. He's been around He's been around here for, for a minute. Um, and honestly, th- there are a few things you just have to expect wide receivers should be able to do and do well. Um, it, it is a complex position with lots of in and outs, um, but it's not as complex as, as some other positions. And for them to not be able to do the basics consistently well from first string to eighth string is something that you have to start asking questions. Um, these kids should be holding on to blocks on screens. These kids should run decent routes with decent head fakes and decent um, decent footwork and you're not seeing that. And so the question is either are, is the talent just the talent level so low at these positions that these kids literally can't run ladders at practice and their footwork is always going to suck. Or is the coaching like, did is like, where is, where, where are we lying with this question mark? There's no separation. And that's been a, that's been a recurring thing over Ron Dugan's career. Now he does have ties to the Florida He's one of the only two guys with ties to Florida on the staff. We'll see how he finishes this recruiting, this cycle at recruiting wide receiver. The Malik McLean thing was big. Tim, I'm going to let you get into the recruiting here in a little bit um, and could possibly finish pretty big with a, with a feller from Louisiana, Destin Hill. But I think he might even give more of that credit to uh, Coach Yak, Coach Johnson. So I think that's fair. Any other staff staff performance that you think is underwhelming or anybody oh, you want to ask? say Odell. I didn't want to say huh? it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it, Odell. I mean, you don't have a Twitter, so nobody can yell at you. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, I'll, t- I'll fall on the grenade. I mean. Oh, no. Perry's dead. <laughs> what is- <laughs> waiting for the lightning strike. Say what you got to say, Montal. What does anyone, I mean, can anybody else here show cause as to what he's done in the last three years to really justify his continued employment as a Florida State coach? Other than his drinking of Gatorade. What, 2 0 as interim? I think, like, if Miles was on the stadium, he just appears out of nowhere and just punches him in the face. Well, the defensive line recruiting this year was good at end. Now, all a lot of those kids have talked it. No, no, no. Patrick Payton and George Wilson, I think, are legitimately they're twitchy type of kids that we have. Oh, I agree. And when you talk to those kids, Sean Bray's going to be a D tackle too. Sean Bray, that's right. Sean Bray Jackson going to be a defensive tackle now. Traditional space eating Robert Cooper defensive tackle. We haven't gotten yet. Tywan Malone's out in the air, out in the ether, reaching for him. Kind of looks like it's not going to be. We're not going to win that one. So, and these kids, when you do listen to their interviews, every one of them mentions Odell Hagens, even though their position coach is John Papuchas. But I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here because we also said earlier in the video podcast for consistency, the interior of the defensive line was one of the biggest disappointments, maybe the biggest when you look about the talent there. 
Exactly. I mean, the, that coach. Uh, the, the, and you've had that same issue for, you know, years. And you have the same complaints from – and I know, you know, it's NFL – Twitter Twitter NFL draft scouts often have the same – The worst. They're about, terrible. Uh, I don't, I hate they they are terrible people. They are awful, and they don't deserve any any respect. But they really do <laughs> show the same complaints about most of the same uh, – most of the, the, you know, most of the same traits that a lot of FSU defensive tackles have coming out. So – Year over year, recruiting's not great. Coaching's not great. I mean, he is a legendary coach for Florida State. He's had many great years. So did Chuck Motto. So did Mickey Andrews. That doesn't mean that their continued employment is necessary. I think it's – I don't know if this offseason – and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying fire Odell right now because I think continuity even in this offseason is important because of the complete lack of continuity these kids have had for years. 2020 is a mulligan, yeah. Yeah, but, um, I mean, you know, I mean, he's not a guy that I want to see on the staff in two years. All right, that's fair. So, moving on. I'm going to talk about, because we've tangentially referred to Mike Norvell as a recruiter, so I want to talk about the moves that he's made in a COVID, no official visit, recruiting cycle for 2020, the, st- the work that the staff is putting for 2022 and beyond. Adam, the transfer portal will be yours. I'm going to let you talk about it all. But first, Tim, talk about uh, what is this? Because you're, you're more tapped into recruiting than the other guys. Um, what, is your, what is your take on Mike Norvell as a recruiter based on what you've seen him do in the most difficult recruiting offseason known to man as the captain of an absolutely uh, dog crap football team? Well, I not to not to cop out, but I think he he's still TBD TBD there as well. Okay, I, I think Coach Jack and Dilly, I think those are the guys that have really been carrying the staff so far and, and really pulling in the recruits. Woodson also, especially with with Travis Hunter next year. Um, I think we saw a glimpse of what Norvell could do at the beginning of the year before COVID hit when they had their first junior day. Uh, you had Brandon Jennings commit, unfortunately didn't stick. You had Josh Farmer commit. And, uh, and both of them talked about having those moments with Norvell and Norvell really kind of selling his, his dream of what the program would look like and the build back. And then when COVID hit, I just don't know if he is as effective if he's not in person. Um, and, and I think that that's and – and this is my thought personally – I don't think he's that great in interviews either. Uh, a, a lot of times, I'll let Perry expound on that because we <laughs> actually talk with a guy. But I, I agree with you too. I was interested because I think the approach that they would take with their official visits, where they would like break down the film of the high school player with them and show them what they were doing wrong. It wasn't just a highlight tape. It's like, oh my gosh, so good. How are you so good? Tell me why you're so good. Here's the dark money that we're slipping in your pocket. Um, I enjoyed the the approach as a differentiator because we're not going to be able to out Georgia, Georgia, and out Clemson, Clemson, and all that stuff. So we do have to find some market inefficiencies there. Um, don't know how good he would have done with the visits. But, Perry, you speak with Mike Norvell over Zoom, but you've got the best relationship with the big cheese out of all of us here. What's your opinion of him? Is he, is he a charismatic guy? He does kind of, with all respect to Coach Mike, he does kind of seem like, like a dork but also a, like an authoritative dork. He's obviously very successful, but what, what's your opinion of Mike? And remember, whatever you say, you will have to speak with him again later. Oh, he's going to see. He's going to – I watch your crappy little show. I know, I, I know. Hey, listen, he's a triple what, option what? fan. Yeah. Crappy? The hell's oh, that? We're, we're, on it. We're, on it. we're on it. We're on it. We're making the crap. Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, my All right. I'm but you. I do think he's a dork. Like, I think no respect, a Adam, right? No respect. <laughs> I for sure think he's a dork. Also, be careful who you I, – I am letting you have free reign, but look at your hair. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, let's go ahead. Slender guy you have to see monitor. next week. We go encourage ahead. your facial hair decisions. I just, <laughs> I just want to be like Newberg. All right, what do you think of Mike? Oh, I think crap. he's a dork. But I think he's like the funny dude. Like I mean, like all of us, none of us are cool. Like we can all admit it. Trey, you have a jersey of yourself behind you. My wife, me, 
like this. I wow. Have, that's the so dorkiest thing I've ever just heard. Bro, don't don't, don't, don't have your again. dork insecurity on me. I'm a my, my, my objectively cool person. A really nice <laughs> so, so, like he Wanting to coat hangers, sense. which is the coolest thing in your <laughs> to on. Listen, we're the coolest. Nobody's obsessed with my specific tobacco. thing, and they're cool. Like I'm Mike Miles Ogo Davis is a I giant cool. nerd for football. And, like, it doesn't always come across to kids who are just like, yo, I'm just trying to ball and be at school. Because, like, even most of you at least play high school football. You know that kids don't care if they play the sport. They really don't even care about the grand sc- – like, it takes, like, a s- certain player to be like, yeah, I watched every game this weekend. So, Mike Norvell is a big, weird dork. But he's he – Okay, I'm not going that far. I'm not going, I'm not going that far. He is now, a, listen, we're going to put that on Twitter. He definitely I, knows how to, like, mess with people. He knows how to talk <laughs> his crap. Like, he knows how to, like – like, he knows how to fit in. So, I think he finds that specific balance. I think when – I was imp- – when you hear in interviews that is sort of – I'm not going to go as far as Perry did. But you do get that sort of – I do get that sort of, um, I guess, the energy that's put off. However – in like press conferences that the first press conference he had when he took the job, I was very surprised at how personable, how excited and fired up I was the clips from the locker room speeches. So I do think that there is a, there is a Norvell in the streets and a Norvell in the sheets. I think that there is a a freak switch that he turns. And I think there is an authoritative guy. All right. Okay. So what next, whatever the next time, let's, let's let's move on. Uh, We're talking about him a freak in the sheets. Trey. Figuratively. He's met this mic. He's he's out here. <laughs> I really hope he watches this portion of the show. <laughs> oh, my I'm God. Can I, can I say oh, real quick? Oh, oh, we literal. have come on a Figurative. The guy turns a switch, and there's an authoritative, charismatic dude that can oh, actually get clo- like coaches, that, I mean, players that have been ignored behaviorally for years to buy into what he's saying. All right, so no, I don't right. if you're watching this, come, come on the show. This is, All right. a, fig- this is a figurative <clears throat> shirts off comparison. All right, so Go here, here, Adam. Here, here's oh, here Adam. Go ahead, Adam. All right, so here, here's the thing for me. All right, the biggest thing that that I think about Mike is the fact that there are dudes, coaches, that want to come work for him. Yep. All right, that for me. Is, is I don't care how he sounds at a press conference. Like I could care less. People want to work for him. And from everything we know and understand about him, he is a hard ass. Like he is Nick Saban. Yeah. Uh, why? Why did Kevin whip his head up when I said ass? He went. It's just that portion of the Zoom, bro. <laughs> but seriously, like dudes want to come work for him, and and he is hardcore. From everything we understand about him, like under the sheets, he is somebody that's very hard to work for. He's, He's hardcore under the sheets. He is very, yeah, you're worse than me, Adam. <laughs> Nick's even demanding. I'm not going to let you get me off. So I'm not. I'm not getting off. So. Uh, Mike's going to. We're going to ramble it now. Oh no, you said get me off. That's funny. Anyway, okay. Um, transfer right. portal. Can I said I was going to you talk about Wait, the transfer. Why don't we let Tim talk? This is his side. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to finish my thought before you know you so so abruptly. Oh man. I think. You saw flashes of Norvell this year in press conferences where when he would kind of quit rambling and channel his emotions, he was very effective and very convincing. And you wanted to like, you wanted to go like rush the stadium for him or whatever. And I think when he has that opportunity one-on-one with the players, that's where he really connects. And he just didn't get to do that. And I don't think that's as effective over a Zoom call as, as this, uh, as this is showing at times. And I think that that shows in his work in the transfer portal, because you're not going to get a kid like graduate transfer, national champion, Mackenzie Milton, to sign up to play with you unless you can sell your vision to him. A guy who's like, what was he, like 21, 22, a man? And then he's, 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 you're, you're selling your vision to men in the transfer portal that do not have time to dilly-dally. They do not have time for the poppycock. And the uh, and the flash, they need substance. They don't just need sizzle. So Adam, and I think we've. I'm very interested to see because I was always going to judge Norvell as a recruiter based on how he did on the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. Adam, talk about how he's done so far. I have made you not talk about this kid from Georgia for about an hour. Let it rip before we end this thing. All right, yeah. So Jermaine Johnson, I mean, he is a flat out stud. Um, he had more sex last year than 
And, and I think in like our entire a, team uh, in a quarter of the snaps, it wasn't the entire team. I know it was the entire he, defensive end group. I mean, he had like five and we had like three. Yeah, or something. I mean, it's, it was, it's pathetic. I but he's, I mean, he's, he's an athlete and he's a stud. And, I mean, that was the, that was the home run get. That was the, uh, we are committed to playing big yes. football get that, yes. that, that, that people have alluded to, uh, on other shows and other podcasts. Um, so that that was massive. I mean, he is a long, explosive athlete that they need on the edge, uh, and he's gonna. They need to be able to get a, a front four pass rush, and he's gonna be able to do that. Uh, from the, I'm assuming he's gonna come in and play the fox fox position, which is that weak side defensive end mm-hmm. uh, stand up. So. I think he slots in there, and then uh, Aloha to Mr. Milton, who you mentioned earlier. I mean, you know, you immediately get enough. You immediately bring leadership upgrade from what everybody talks about the young man. Credibility um, too, national yeah, credibility. Yeah, real credibility. Uh, and I mean, he's he's got arm talent. I, we'll see if the leg works. Uh, from everything, everything <laughs> we've heard, and uh, I've talked to a few, a couple people that have that have talked to some UCF uh, coaches that say he just absolutely lit practices up down there, and they just they you know they wanted to go with the young kid that they had. Um, um, so the we'll kid, see. The young kid was throwing for he threw for six hundred yards in a game this year. Yeah, I mean, he, like I mean he's a stud. Yards. He's a stud. He's a stud. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like they were you know just playing some dud. Uh, so right. we'll but you know again we we'll see how healthy Milton is when he gets here. But that was an upgrade to the quarterback room. That that he he is the signal caller that they need. He can run and throw, or he can at least throw. Um, you know, it's clear. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not besmirching his name here. I don't want Kevin to get all excited, but it's clear that Chuba just needed a little extra work, a little extra seasoning, okay, a little more experience. Uh, it's crystal clear that Tate shouldn't be playing Division One football. And oh God, oh God! I always said don't I don't even I, give him a G five. I kid, I kid. I'm just saying that. To, I'm just saying that to make Kev mad. Uh, but, you know, and it's clear that Jordan, as much as I enjoyed what he did and the, the running element that he brought to the offense, it's clear that he's best served in a utility-type role, um, kind of like what I think they wanted to do with him earlier in the year when they brought him in against Miami. So, you know, so far they've got Milton and they've got Jermaine Johnson in the portal. Uh, there's some buzz about the kid out of uh, Kansas. Uh, Andrew Andrew Parchment, Parchment. Yeah. Yep. With big some wide, receivers. Yeah. Big range of long, long, long stride wide receiver that can get down the field that they obviously we got that corner from Arkansas, right? Yeah. Jarquez yeah. McClellan. McClellan, yeah. I mean, he's a – McClellan. You know, he was a, a slightly below average uh, SEC starting cornerback at Arkansas, but how much of that was because Arkansas really sucked. I mean, he opted out this year. Scheme wasn't great. Uh, he looks like a good zone corner to me. We'll see what he – we'll see what he can do. Uh, if anything, he's depth. He's an experienced body that you can bring in, and uh, you know he can push. He can push Jones. He can push Dent if Dent stays around. Uh, you know, and push uh, Demory Tate on the other side. So we'll we'll see. But so far, they. I mean, so far, I think they're batting three for three in the portal. Um, you know, there's a potential. This kid out of Northwestern, DN out of Northwestern. Uh, there's a D tackle out of Penn State that they're talking to, looking at. Uh, so, you know, so there's a few guys. I, I think in the end. They're going to be judged on whether they can get an offensive tackle in here uh, that can come in and play the left side of the line and be matched up across from either Scott or Love Taylor and really solidify what they want to do up front. I agree. And the the, the like I said, we've got three right now. There's going to be more to come. To me, the Johnson one was one that was most impressive because that yeah. kid was yeah. wanted by some some larger programs, and he chose Florida State. Tim, yeah. go ahead. Before we this, you're you're it. Before we, I'm going to do the final wrap up. I, I just wanted to say, I think the the transfer portal and how they're attacking it, I, I'm wondering if this is the the true recruiting prowess of this staff because they're they're getting uh, almost equal footing with everybody else. Whereas when they came into the Florida State job and trying to recruit the high schools, especially in Florida, they were behind these staffs almost two years. And so now when these kids are popping in the portal, unless there's some kind of prior uh, relationship that they have with somebody, this staff is coming in with the same abilities and same, you know, same playing ground as all these other coaches and they're winning these, you know, they're winning Milton, they're winning 
Johnson. Uh, they're, they're in it with Leota from Northwestern and, and Shelton from Penn State. And, and these are four-star kids. These are impact players that will come in and start day one from Florida State. And you're seeing these coaches win these battles. Agree. All right. Fantastic conversation. What I'm going to do now, be as brief as you can. I want – some targets, some goals. Like, what are your expectations for next year? What would be a good year for Florida State? Just just say some stuff. And then I want to see if you think that Florida State can actually do that. Juan, well, I'm going to start with you. What would be a successful 2021 for you? And do you think that right now we're set up to accomplish that? Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm sort of going to cheat on this a little bit and sort of take into – phenomenal. Yeah, the recruiting that's going on right now because that that transfer portal recruiting that we're talking about, I think it's a huge factor. But we just talked about obviously those three three guys, McClellan, uh, Jermaine, and Milton. And you know, if you can add that offensive tackle that you guys talked about, if you can add one or two more guys that can you know take rotational type snaps or even be starters, that's huge. I mean, that that makes a big difference for the team. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, the, that leads into what I was going to get at is that I want to see, you know, when they finally open things back up, the NCAA, I want to see how Mike recruits, you know, although he's, you know, dealt a pretty crap hand at this point, I want to see how they recruit with everything open and going again. And, and I want to, you know, seeing how that goes. And then I want to see continued increase of confidence on the football field. I mean, you know, I think we, we saw more and more of it at certain position groups, piece by piece, player by player. Uh, they've got, you know, some personnel issues that are not going to be fixed next year. You know, this is not going to be a 10-win football team next year. I'm not expecting that. Not even really that worried about wins and losses. I just want to see a team that looks better game by game. Confidence and more competitive recruiting once everything's in person. That's Juan. Perry, what are you looking for next year? I want to go 500 in the ACC, which okay. isn't really something you can predict right now because who knows what the schedule is even going to be at this point. Like, they technically have everything figured out outside of dates mm -hmm. as far as opponents, but I think it's possible to win four at right now, assuming that it would stay the same in the 21 schedule would have Wake Forest, Syracuse, I would say hopeful wins, definite wins maybe. Um, you could have won against Georgia Tech this year. I need to see that, like, beat the teams you need to beat. FSU could have beat Pitt this year, technically maybe, if they did what they were supposed to. FSU could have beat Louisville, technically maybe, if they did what they were supposed to do. But we saw the results of that just not happening. Right. Beat up on the teams you're supposed to beat up on, and if not, Make those like three touchdown games, two, make it more competitive. Win those games if you need to, but just win them. Like, don't even just – don't lose it in the first quarter. Like, Gotcha. gotcha. So, 500, I think, is attainable in the ACC. It's eight-game schedule. Win half your games. Try to figure it out. A real high goal, pie in the sky, is beat one of the rivals, but – Eh. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Derek King's back. Florida's kind of rolling. Who knows? Uh, Kev, what are you looking for next year? Yeah, so a uh, question for you. Who who goes in the top ten of the NFL draft? What what are the big three positions people are looking for? Quarterback, Quarterback yes. defensive end, tackle. Quarterback, defensive end, tackle. Um, last year you see Miami, very similar recruiting class, probably in the 20s. Um, they brought in like seven transfers about what we're looking to do. And their big guys were their defensive end and their quarterback. And they went from being a crappy team that lost to FIU to being a 10-win football team overnight because they brought an elite quarterback and an elite defensive end in Quincy Roche. Um, and I, I don't know if Phillips was a transfer or not. Uh, but A year came. before. He, yeah, but he didn't really play that much that year before. He really came on this right. year. So they addressed two of the biggest positions in football, and they addressed it with – two really good football players. And what I've seen Florida State do is do the same thing. They brought in probably what looks like is going to be the best uh, transfer quarterback available, um, in my opinion. I, I'm a big McKenzie Milton guy. I think I think he brings a lot to the table personality-wise and skill level-wise, even if his foot is – his leg is totally bummed still. Um, May not be. And, and I, I think there's reason to – 
be optimistic that this team isn't going to be the same as last year. Um, I think if we're able to address the middle linebacker with, with a little bit more talent, I would feel more optimistic. I, I think those kids are, are talented, but young. Um, I, I don't know what their ceiling is going to be, but if you brought in someone who's ready to contribute there tomorrow, this team isn't going to look like the same team we saw this year. This team is going to be competitive. Um, I, I don't think you're going to be competitive with the, the Miamis and the and the Clemsons and the Floridas of the world. Um, but I, I do think that you'll be. I think you'll be more talented than the than the Louisvilles and the the NC States of the world. And I think you you should have a good chance of 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 winning those games. And so like eight ish eight ish wins. I think Adish is 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 an optimistic look, but it's not something that's without precedent in the in the way that we've addressed positions that are the most important positions on the field. Um, and so, if you want to have an optimistic look to next year, that's what I would give you. Okay, good. Hey, the, the evidence is there. Uh, Tim, what about you? What are you looking for next year? I just want to say at times, like, I, I feel like Kevin is a much, much, much smarter version of me. And the Miami <laughs> comparison, the Miami comparison was, was dead on because I, I've made this same conversation with Juan uh, over on Smell Rap that, for, that Miami changed their team with three transfers, if you count Jalen Phillips. With Phillips, Roche, and King, they, like, exactly what you said, they went from a crappy, I mean, a team with talent, but was playing crappy to a team that, you know, when, when, are they going to win 10 games this year or something like that? Um, if Florida State can bring in another defensive end uh, and, and a solid offensive tackle, I think you can see that type of uh, tra- transformation for Florida State. The thing that's working against Florida State that Miami's not facing or didn't face is Florida State's got a brutal schedule next year. Uh, unless COVID messes it up again. I mean, they have five losses almost guaranteed when you've got Notre Dame, Florida, Miami, Clemson, and North Carolina on the schedule next year. I mean, so I think if you are six and six regular season next year, I would count that as like a pie in the sky, huge successful, uh, because that means you beat the teams you were supposed to beat. Um, and, and if you're competitive in those losses as well. But, uh, I mean, the schedule does them no favors. And so six wins, I think, is a very successful season. I also think, too, that depth is going to be a concern. We're getting impact players, but it's not going to be a fully stacked roster. You can see that with the amount of PWO activity. So we're always, even though we're getting some really good guys in there, we're always a couple injuries away from disaster. Adam, to finish it off, what are you looking for for next year? Uh I was looking at the home schedule. So they played Notre Dame. They played Jacksonville State, UMass. They play Louisville, Miami, NC State, and Syracuse. So I'm looking at a above 500 record at home. That's what I that's what I would like to see next year. It's not optimistic or pessimistic, pessimistic, whatever. I want to see them have. I want to see them start winning and having an above an above 500 winning record at home. Uh, I think that that's where football begins. You've got to protect your home turf. And if you could do that, then you could go on the road and, and find it, steal a win here or there, and then you start looking at having more success. Um, so, you know, uh, those – you know, I'm looking at you got to find a way to beat Syracuse, NC State, uh, Louisville, and then, you know, whip up on UMass and, and Jacksonville State. You're not – you're probably not beating Notre Dame. You're, you're probably not beating Miami next year. So, those Louisville, NC State, Syracuse games are, are three big ones for me on the schedule next year where you need to try to go, you know, maybe – Two and one uh, uh, to to probably have you know to consider next year a successful season, and then on the recruiting trail, I mean, I think you need to hold on to Travis Hunter. He's probably the best football player in the country, uh, in tw- maybe in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. He's a, a D back uh, slash wide receiver out of Georgia. Uh, the kid's a freak show. Um, I think he's got some uh, Charles Woodson in his game. Uh, so he's a kid you need to hold on to. You got uh, Marvin Jones Jr., who, who who's a, a defensive end you need to land, five star type defensive end you need to land. That's a legacy. Um, yeah, I mean, hell, Trey, I, I want to see him have spring ball. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're talking next year. Like, I want to see him have spring ball. Like, I want to see these guys get an opportunity <laughs> to work. You know, their greatest strengths are coaching. I want to see him get an opportunity to coach. It's 
you know, people are like, oh, you know, you're getting them coached up. You're not getting guys coached up during the season. That's not how that's not how in season football really works. You're you're working game plan. You know, you're 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 trying you're trying to teach fundamentals, but fundamentals are taught in the spring and that early and that uh, you know that late summer, early fall practices. They lost those this year. I want to see them get the opportunity to have that. I want to see Coach Storms have an opportunity to get these guys in a weight program and see what he can do because he's you know considered one of the best out there. You know, those are the things I want to. I, I, I'll start having ideas about next year when I get to see them have those things available to them. Right, and it's like you said. The I think we're all being very like obtainable, being realistic. Yeah, yeah. But once, but once you with, with a real off season, you don't really know how much this team could improve because you didn't really see. None. You didn't really see a true first year or even a year zero. Mike Norvell, coach Florida State. However. <clears throat> Leads for a lot of intrigue, leads for a lot of interesting film, leads for a lot of interesting conversation, which you can find on the X's and Knowles YouTube channel. Subscribe, like, tell all of your friends. Go to the Seminole Rap Podcast. Go to that, that dope-ass RSS feed. Give them a five-star review. Say nice stuff. Subscribe. Tell your friends about that as well. Go to Tomahawk Nation. Read our just our plethora, our golden words. Just nobody writes better words. Nobody knows football English better than the people at Tom Hawk Nation. Listen, I have enjoyed myself immensely. I know that you will enjoy it immensely. I think my five compatriots, my compadres, for them, I am Trey Rowland. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, go Knowles and nobody else. <laughs>